I'm Anthony Scaramucci, and welcome to Open Book, where I talk with some of the most interesting and brilliant minds in our world today. It's great to have you on the show. I, I first read The 48 Laws of Power. Um, fascinating book. I got, you know, I, I don't know when you published that book, but I think I was 50 when I read the book. So that would be eight years ago. Uh -huh. um, and I remember thinking, geez, I should have read this book when I was 25, actually. It was, yeah, but then I also said to myself, you know what, at age 25, I probably wouldn't have got everything that you said right. in the book either. So, right. you know, it's one of these things where I probably should have read it at 25 and then read it again at 50. But let's start there. Finding your power. You, you were 40 when you wrote this book, if I remember from our research correctly. How did you master what your power was? Well, it was a journey. It didn't come automatically to me. I, I had a lot of pain and suffering along the way of a lot of jobs that didn't fit me very well. And I kind of had to go and learn from this and not get down on myself. And And I always thought that I was, uh, you know, I knew that I could write and that I, I wanted to be a writer. I just couldn't figure out what form it would take. But in the process of of apprenticing as a writer. I worked in journalism. I traveled throughout Europe. I worked in Hollywood. I had um, probably over 60, 70 different kinds of jobs. And I witnessed all kinds of power games being played. I was never the power player. I was always just an employee working middle level, low level employee, observing the different games that were going on. And so my experience in Hollywood was probably the sharpest among them, where I saw a lot of the manipulative tactics that I discuss in the 48 Laws were actually being used in real life. And as a student of history, I thought, you know, I read a lot of, for instance, Machiavelli is sort of one of the main figures in the 48 Laws. And things that were going on in Renaissance Italy with Cesare Borgia, with the popes, with all the kind of conniving and, and games playing i was the same thing was going on in hollywood in the, in the things that i was witnessing a lot less bloody but still still power games and so my source of power came from just observing this all and saying okay i had an opportunity to write a book which came about in the mid 90s and i wanted to reveal all of these things that i think are kind of secrets it's stuff that people don't like to talk about. We don't like to talk about the manipulative side of human nature, which is actually quite pronounced and very strong. You see it as a theme throughout history. People who understand the power game, who have an instinct for it, generally get very far. Other people who can be very talented and creative, but don't understand the power game, they suffer a lot. And so I wanted to reveal all of these things, all of these secrets, if you will, that I had uncovered in my 20 years of working at all kinds of jobs. And in the course of that, I have discovered my source of power, which was revealing the, the, these tactics, these strategies. And since then, from somebody who had no power up until then, I do a lot of consulting. I have, I have millions of readers all around the globe. So it's, it's been an incredible transformation, at least for me. But it, that was sort of the, the, the starting point, the inspiration behind that book. Well, there's, there's one law that I have consistently broken, okay? Uh, and that's law number four. Uh, and it's obviously... Yes, exactly. I am always... It could be a result of my Italian upbringing. It could be a result of... Uh, the way I got raised, my Catholicism, my uh, confessional standing with the world, whatever it might be, I always say more than necessary. Uh, you know, but it, it's a great lesson because, um, you know, it gives you this opportunity. There's more bandwidth. There's more flexibility. I guess when I when I read your book at age 50, I said, wow, I could have deployed a lot of these things and perhaps been more powerful and even perhaps got a, a more successful career. Um, but I, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is the intersection of controlling your cynicism, staying fresh, staying somewhat idealistic. Um, how do you 
in your work? Um, I mean, this is a question I've been dying to ask you for several years, so I'm just going to hit you straight between the eyes, okay? To really understand human nature and to understand the impulse of the animal, yeah. uh, one could get one could get very cynical. Sophocles once said, perhaps the best among us are the ones that were never born because of this cynical aspect of human nature. Yet when I look at you, you seem like you have a joy de vie of life. When I look at you, it seems like you're fulfilling yourself. Um, and I'm reminded of what my grandmother once said to me, which I always say to my children, the best among us choose not to judge human frailty so harshly. But here you are, you're almost a clairvoyant, you're, you've almost got an electron microscope down to the elements, the good and bad elements of human nature. And so you and I both know there are dark forces in human nature. I experienced them in the American government. I experienced them on Wall Street. I've experienced them in the cryptocurrency markets. I'm sure. Uh, and yet I'm sitting here before you loving my life so how do you blend and how do you balance all of that for yourself, Robert? Well, I, I'm somebody who's actually quite idealistic. And if I had to um, characterize myself prior to writing the book, I was actually quite naive and innocent. And so to me, the, the game is not to become paranoid, not to become overly cynical, cynical about human nature but to be realistic about the people around you, right? To understand them and to understand where they're coming from. So we talk about um, the law about appealing to people's self-interest, which I don't like to think of as cynical at all. So understanding that people have their own lives, their own needs, that life, their, their life is full of pressure, that people never have enough time, and that if you're trying to sell something to them, if you're trying to interest them in your ideas, you have to look at them through their, through their eyes, figure out what it is that they need, what they're going through, and then to make your appeal to them for help or whatever through what they need to kind of supply them what they're missing in life. I don't personally find that cynical. I just find that realistic, right? And so if you go around in life, like I did, being completely naive and completely innocent, what happens is you end up suffering a lot, right? So law number one is never outshine the master. And it's a law you, you violated, always say, say less than necessary. I violated, oh, never outshine the master time and time again. I tried too hard when I joined a company or a group to impress people, to show them how brilliant I was. And I made a lot of enemies and I was generally fired for it. And I never figured out why I was fired. And so to understand that people have egos, that the people above you who are your superior, who are your bosses, they all have egos, they all have insecurities, that you could inadvertently trigger those insecurities. Having that realistic attitude is going to save you a lot of pain, a lot of misery, a lot of unnecessary mistakes in life, right? So being aware of these issues, being aware that people have egos, being aware that people have their own interests, that people are generally self-absorbed, to me, isn't, isn't cynical. It's just recognizing the human animal as we are, right? And you know, there's a lot of shame in, um, around the concept of power. People are often ashamed of their own ambition, of their own actions, and it makes people very hypocritical. And I'm saying, look, there are, it, it's kind of na human nature to occasionally manipulate, to kind of never exactly say what you think about other people. So let's just accept that and not and not pretend that, that we are these angels, etc. So I don't see it as cynical. I just see it as being a realistic attitude towards life. Uh, yeah, listen, it's, it, it's very well said. I want you to take the word insecurity for a moment. Yeah. What makes somebody insecure? Well, 
you know, um, first of all, it's it's kind of natural to feel insecure. We all we all go through that, but um, you know, it depends on 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 your background and and who you are. But oftentimes, um, we feel when we feel insecure, when we feel like we're there's something about us that's vulnerable, or that you know is kind of a weak side of us. We try to cover it up. So people are basically um, kind of, they don't want to confront their own insecurities. They don't want to confront their own weaknesses. And that's what tends to make it worse. But if you're in a position where um, you feel confident, you have the experience, you know what you're doing, you know that, for instance, you're able to do this job, you're able to pull it off, you don't really have insecurities. So a lot of insecurities stem from the fact that you're kind of pretending that you think you know what you're, what you're doing, but you're not really prepared. You're not really as experienced as you think you are. And you're in a role that you're not necessarily up for, for fulfilling. And deep down inside, you're aware of it. And I try and tell people, often the most powerful people around you can be the most insecure. I don't know if you confronted that with the people in government that you were dealing with. No, I, even, know, even I, I obviously itself. did. You know, it, it's not going to come as a surprise to you. You know, my press conference, uh, I only did one press conference inside the White House, but, you know, General Kelly, who fired me, told me it wasn't the phone call I made to the journalist. It was my press conference that ultimately got me fired because you know, I was answering the question straight up and it was causing too much attention to be drawn away from the principal. Right. And uh, that was it, you know, and uh, boom. And so, you know, no, 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 no problem. Probably the best thing that ever happened to me was getting fired from the situation. But but I, I definitely violated one of your your laws there. But I guess I'm trying to understand the insecurities, because if you take somebody that's the president of the United States, you would probably think that they're not going to be that insecure, that they'd have a, a game, that they'd have some level of self-confidence. But but you're right. Sometimes these people that are in these very big, powerful positions are the most insecure uh, and they're overcompensating for something. So, so how do you handle that, sir? Well, you have to be aware of it, you know. So we like to think, you know, the problem with, with humans is we take everything upon appearances. If somebody acts like they're very strong and very confident, they're the boss, they, they reach this, he or she reached this top position, they must be strong, they must not have any insecurities. And I'm telling you, the people who reach the top are often the most insecure because, um, first of all, they're, they're much more vulnerable than they were before, right? They have much more to lose than they have before. When you're young and you're starting out, you really have not much to lose when you're in your 20s. But if you become the president or the top of a corporation in your 30s, you now have much more vulnerabilities. You have your reputation at stake. You have people around you. So the other thing that happens when you're in a position of power is everyone around you is, is a yes man or a yes woman. They're telling you what you they want what you want to hear, right? They're trying to impress you. They're trying to get on your good side. So you're never getting an honest appraisal of who you are. And you never quite feel comfortable about it. You never quite feel, do people really like me? Am I as popular as I seem to be? They're saying they love my ideas, etc. But people in power are often very, very insecure about the degree to which they're liked. I think when I look at someone like Elon Musk right now, I see someone who's actually extremely insecure about himself and needs attention and wants to prove to himself that he's as strong and powerful as his reputation seems to warrant, right? And so he's kind of constantly playing for attention here. And so when you reach these, these positions, right, you never quite feel comfortable. You never feel... Do I deserve it? Do people really like me as much as they do? You're not necessarily consciously voicing this or even thinking it, but unconsciously it's, it's, it's making you very, very insecure, right? Right. No, it's, it, listen, it's fascinating. I, uh, you know, when I, people, 
we all have our uh, superpower, if you will. Um, again, self-described, I mean, who the hell knows what our superpowers really are. But for me, I think what's powered me up over my life is my intellectual curiosity. You know, I've been uh, always, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not stuck on one category. I'm happy to read about physics, but I'm also happy to read about philosophy, but then, you know, longevity. But then if we're going to take a turn into Machiavelli, no, no problem. I'm happy to spend the time and the energy. Um, in your book, The 50th Law, which was interesting because uh, that's actually the book I got my son Anthony to read. I think uh -huh. it's primarily related to 50 Cent. You, know, you, had, right. you, had, you had written it with him. And... Marcus Aurelius, when I was a kid, somebody handed me his book and insisted that I read it. And there's been better translations from the one that I read early on. But I have made it a habit of mine to try to read that book once a year. It's a short book, uh, but it, it helps to refresh the ideas of Stoicism and helps to refresh the ideas of living in the moment and to try to control your uh, your emotions, but also not to overreact to things that are happening to you, which sometimes we have a tendency to do in our modern society. Um, describe the importance of learning from history. And obviously, the, the General Aurelius's book had a big impact on you. Why did it have a big impact on you? Uh, tell us about the first time you read that book. Well, I read the meditations um, probably the first time when I was in college. Um, and, uh, you know, I was very, very, very impressed by it. I was very impressed by the honesty of it. Um, he, he discusses things that most people avoid, just sort of everyday wisdom. You know, the thing about philosophy, so much of philosophy has no application to daily life. You know, you, you, you read these, these academics, et cetera, et cetera, or someone like Kant or Schopenhauer. It's very interesting, but you don't know how to apply it. But Stoicism or Marcus Aurelius, it was like he was in the room with you. It was like your father giving you advice. It's philosophy mm -hmm. for how to live your life to the, to the mm -hmm. best extent possible. Um, but history for me is extremely important because you know, we all need to learn. We all need to expand our horizons. None of us are perfect. Our experience is limited, right? It's limited to our the time that we live in. It's limited to the people that we're around, to the experiences that we have. But history is like this incredible, vast storehouse, this insanely enormous library of wisdom, of experiences, of mistakes that have been made, things that you can learn from, right? So I think it was Bismarck who says, I learn from the mistakes of other people, right? Because we all make mistakes in life and we learn very p painful lessons from them. But in history, there are thousands of these lessons, right? And so the other thing that history gives you is it gives you a sense of proportion. It gives you a sense that things are relative. So when people get all excited in the moment like they are now about certain trends going on about, you know, this is what's happening to America, or this is what the moment that we're living in. When you read a lot of history, you're able to stand back and go, wait a minute, this is going to pass. This moment in history is going to pass. It's just a phase that we're going in, going through, and things are continually repeating. What well, seems to be something that's never happened before, like the crash of cryptocurrency, has happened thousands of times before, in our past with all kinds of speculations and all kinds of financial bubbles, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing is new. So reading history is like, it's just like continually expanding your own experience and giving you lessons and wisdom that you can't necessarily get from your, the narrow experiences of your own life. I mean, you know, listen, it's, it's, it's incredibly well said. I, I, I do, draw from history. I think it does, uh, it, it provides an anchor. It's almost like a grounding wire. Um, you're able to you know, step back a little bit and be a little bit more dispassionate about what's happening to you on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I want to move to the dark side for a second. Sure. Uh, you know, when I read uh, Herman Hesse's book about Damien, do you remember that book? Sure. Talk, I love that. When he, when he, 
when he when he talked about the abraxas. You remember he talked about the good parts of our personality and the bad parts of our personality. Uh-huh. Um, when I read your books, um, I really do feel like I'm cycling through Western and Eastern literature, and I'm like, oh wow, Robert's brilliant. He got that from Damien, or wait a minute, he may have gotten that piece from Siddhartha. Or wait a minute, obviously he probably read Magic Mountain to have this yeah. distillation from Thomas Mann. Um, and so we have this dark side. Um, the dark side is interesting because we're all human. Even the worst among us, Robert, are human. You know, And we have a tendency to demonize the worst among us and try to make them either different from human. But you know, and I know, it's fair to say that we all have a dark side. So are we all aware that we have one? You mentioned the hypocrisy. Do, do some of us try to pretend that we don't have one? I certainly don't try to pretend that I don't have one. I'm pretty up, up front about my dark side and like the hot buttons that would get me to the point of a malevolent situation. Um, but is that is that narcissism to have a dark side? Is that, what is the... How would you describe the dark side in human nature? And do we all have one? And are obviously some of us in denial about it. What's your reaction to what I'm saying? We all have a dark side. And in in my book, The Laws of Human Nature, I explain where it comes from. I call it the shadow, which is to take Carl Jung's concept of the shadow. And basically the ideas behind it is when you were a child, very early on, three or four years old, you were like a complete human being, a complete personality. You have had aggressive impulses and you had angelic impulses. You were loving to your parents, but you could be very mean and nasty to them. You could pull your sister's hair. You could play all kinds of dirty tricks. And the next moment you could be loving and giving and forgiving, etc. You were this complete person, right? You had all of these impulses that were natural to you. And then what happens is you get older, you go through school, you get five, six, seven years old, People start telling you, Robert, you have to stop behaving like that. You have to be nicer to your sister. You have to be nicer to your parents. Teachers start telling you, this is what you should be doing. This is what you're not good at. This is what you're good at, et cetera, et cetera. Your your peers, you're, you're feeling these pressures to conform, to appear to be a nice person. And all of that dark energy, that aggressiveness, that ambition, that kind of envy that we all feel towards other people, it gets kind of pushed down further and further. We repress it. And then by the time we get into our 20s, that part of our personality is so completely repressed and forgotten that it sneaks out in moments that we're not even aware of. It comes out in sudden bursts of anger. And we could say to ourselves, God, I got so angry at this person like I was going to kill them. Where did that come from? I'm not normally like that. And then you'll say to yourself, well, that's not who I am. That's just, that was just some circumstance. But in fact, that is exactly who you are. That is your shadow communicating. That is that four-year-old, that five-year-old inside of you that is actually trying to come out. And so the problem, Anthony, is people, some people are complete denial of it, like the social justice warrior kind of cliche. They think that everything, they're so righteous that they have no dark side. Other people are kind of aware of it, but to actually confront it, to actually look at it and admit it to yourself and then try to do something with that energy and not try and repress it, that is very, very difficult for us because we all are are trying to we're very much invested in the idea that I'm a good person. I'm rational. Yeah, self-identification. Yeah, exactly. I'm rational. I'm moral. I'm generous, etc. And then to actually have to confront the truth, that there's another side of you that isn't necessarily so good. It's very painful, but it's very, very, very necessary. And I explain in the book that this dark side contains incredible amount of energy and power behind it. If you understand it, if you confront it, and if you channel it to something that's more productive and more pro-social. So many people are kind of aware of their dark side, but they're also very much afraid of it. And so they go kind of halfway and they never sort of incorporate it into their personality. No, I think it's a fascinating part of your work. I want to, I'm going to throw a couple of concepts out at you. So this will be a little bit more rapid fire. 
Um, these are really things that I've extracted from your books. Um, and you can answer them shortly. Um, ego. How do we keep our ego in check? We all have one. You know, we're all faced with it. Obviously, the, the best of the uh, best story on ego for me is always Achilles after the death of Patroclus and he's super upset at Agamemnon and he decides that he's no longer going to fight. He's got his ego in the game. Um, how do we keep our ego in check? Well, um, you have to, you have to be aware of the problem first. The, the problem that most people have is they're not aware, first of all, that they have an ego, right? They're not even aware that, that, that that's an issue that they're completely self-absorbed and that they're riddled with all sorts of insecurities. And the reason that they're reacting so emotionally is because of some kind of weakness or, or wound to their ego that you're inflicting on. So the main way to check your ego, the main way to check any of the negative characteristics in human nature is to be aware of it, to be aware of this is a problem. So I know in my life personally, if I get in an argument and I'm a great believer that arguments are extremely counterproductive. They generally don't lead to anything good. I often step back, usually afterwards, because I don't have enough self-control in the moment. And I go, that was probably the reason I got upset. The reason I reacted so angrily is because of my ego. And that, you know, I have to be aware of that. And being aware of it, next time I can keep it in check. So the way to keep it in check is to monitor yourself, to see how much of your behavior is actually being um, produced or triggered by your ego and your insecurities. Well, I mean, I'll share this with you. It's, uh, you know, talk about ego. Ultimately, my decision to work for Mr. Trump was based on my ego. It was sure. an egocentric decision. You know, my my wife probably hated Trump almost as much as Melania hates him, Robert. I mean, like very high threshold. She she and hates him. She, oh my God, can't stand it. And she tried to talk me out of doing it. Of course, we no, almost got I mean, divorced I mean, over I mean, it. Melania. Then, like, I mean, Melania. Oh, Melania hates him. Oh my God. Oh my God. I mean, come on. She. I mean, come on. I mean, you, you know, listen. I mean, when you when the windows open and you hear clippity clop, it's not a zebra. It's a horse. You know, what I mean, just look at her behavior and look at her reactions and plus you know she's got too many tells you know it's sort of like a paid job for her at this point but okay. you know, it's fine you know she she has her role it is what it is but but you know Deirdre my wife Deirdre was like don't work for them it's going to be very bad for you you guys will not mix together also you made your own money he right. got it from his dad it's going to drive him crazy just don't do it it's a bad mix and but I didn't listen because my ego dictated that I needed to go work for the American president. So I was a blue collar kid. I went to Tufts and Harvard. I built a successful business. And so now for my personal narrative, sure. I'm going to go work in the White House. You see what I mean? And so it's a cautionary tale about the misuse of ego and not having enough self-awareness or good parts of reflection to avoid that mind. Now, look, the good news is, apropos to your books, uh, and a lot of stuff that Marcus Aurelius talks about is that obstacles and setbacks can be opportunities. You know, I made the most of that disastrous decision and the eventual small atomic bomb that exploded in my life after I got fired after 11 short days. But, but I did have my ego uh, in the wrong place, Robert, in terms of making that decision. So that's one of the reasons why I asked you about that. Um, what about free will, sir, and freedom, the concept of freedom? Do you think we have free will? You, or do you think we're a hive mind? Do well, you think that, I mean, it's uh, something that... Um, what do you I, think? It's something that, that interests me. You know, I'm almost, it's a question that obsesses me, and I can't really say for sure one way or the other. I've always leaned more towards the idea that we do have free will, Right. But there's always a sense of, of fate kind of guiding our life. If you look at your decisions, if you look at your thought process, so often you can't go back and go, was I really in control? Did that really come from me? There seems to be something else operating here. But recently for my new book, I've been doing a lot of research in neuroscience, etc. And one thing that I, that I, a concept that I found extremely interesting is, 
we don't really have free will according to how neuroscience analyzes what goes on in the brain just the moments before we make a decision. What we have is what somebody has called free won't as opposed to free will. We have the ability that. to have an impulse that comes up from somewhere deep inside of us that we don't control. And we can step back and go, I'm not going to give into that impulse. I'm going to say right. no to it. I'm not going to smoke that cigarette. I'm not going to I have that, that affair. I'm not going to drink here. That is free right. will, but it's really free won't. It's really something is coming up that you can't control, but you're saying, I'm not going to give I, into it. I, I needed to meet you about 25 or 30 years ago. Okay. I mean, you know, I, 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 I needed to hear this sort of stuff. Um, let's switch to the 33 strategies of war. Yeah. Another fantastic uh, book. You know, so much of our civilization and things we take for granted come from warfare, which is highlighted in your book. You know, um, when uh, Teddy White, who wrote The Making of the Presidency in 1960, had the opportunity to interview Jackie Kennedy after the president died. She asked him what was on his nightstand. He said The Guns of August uh, right. by Barbara Tuckman. Right. And so uh, when I read your book, I was like, OK, you've read all of this stuff. You've read Klaus Switch and Sun Tzu and The Guns of August. And you even, you know, I think you read Rickover. Maybe you didn't, but I think you'd read Admiral Rickover stuff because sure. uh, it was all it was all in there. Even Eisenhower's diaries of uh, D-Day, I felt, were in your book. Uh, certainly Caesar's diaries uh, about his uh, conquests were in your book, uh, which was uh, beautifully written and well translated into English. Um, but but we're there again, sir, because what happened in the guns of August, you had the waning memory of statesmen and women. They were dying off from the Napoleonic Wars. You did have a small skirmish in the uh, in the mid 1800s between the French and the Germans. But by and large, what von Metternich put together at the Congress of Vienna kept peace in Europe uh, for 100 years, which was an odd thing to happen because we both know that wars were breaking out since Charlemagne every you know 25 to 30 years. It was another big war in Europe. Uh, but von Metternich understood the balance of power. Kissinger, you reference Kissinger a lot, sir, so you know he's a big student of von Metternich. Uh, this balance of power, and Kennedy was obsessed with it. He was like, okay, how do we stave off war? How do we cheat history and human nature to prevent the war? He gave that very famous speech at American University in June of 1963 talking about this. Um, obviously, he pushed for the nuclear disarmament treaty. Um, and yet here we are, our nature, our nature guides us towards this. Uh, we, we, we have our living memory of war. It goes by the wayside uh, and a result of which we glorify it and we become way more nationalistic and we become way more tribal. The bellicosity of our rhetoric increases and then we do the imperial overreach or we do something that's damaging to ourselves. Uh, because we don't anticipate the horror of war, not having hit the living life experience. So, so talk to me about where you think we are right now in the world. It's 2022. Uh, we've had more or less 80 years, proxy wars here and there, but more or less 80 years of uh, peace and relative prosperity in the world since World War II. Where are we now, sir? Well, we're on the surface at a dangerous moment. Um, where the kind of balances of power are, are shifting. And I think, um, you know, looking at something like the regimes like in Russia or in China or even in Iran, we see states um, that I find personally extremely dangerous um, because, you know, they talk about in, in warfare, there's something called the asymmetry of forces. So when, um, when one side has many more, um, you know, artillery and soldiers, the other side tries to leverage its weakness into power, which is what guerrilla warfare does. But another asymmetry is on the moral level. So when countries like Russia, for instance, 
are willing to do everything. They're, they're, they fight a kind of complete warfare that's not just on the battlefield, but it's on the information side. It's on this, it's on social media. It's on the internet. It's through spying. You know, they do, this is something that came from the Soviet Union, etc. They practice total warfare using politics, using culture, using everything at their means. Disinformation, server forms, uh, tribal identification to force yeah. uh, more dissension. And so, um, and we're not like that really, you know, I mean, we, we have our, our dark moments in history. Don't get me wrong. We're not, we're not angels, but we don't have, we're not willing to go as far as they are. And so I think it's like, why, why, sir, why, why are we not willing to go as far as they are? Well, first of all, we have uh, uh, democratic traditions and uh, we have open government where, you know, I mean, it's, it's the ideal. It's not always practiced, but there are things that you can't do without all the branches of government, without the public knowing what exactly is going on. But when you live in a controlled environment, like in Russia or in China, the public doesn't even have to know half of what you're doing. There's no accountability. There's no kind of counterforce. There's no balance of power between different branches of government. So you have complete control. And I think um, we can be a little bit naive about these things. So a lot of people are thinking, well, something like Ukraine, you know, that's not really in our self-interest as a country, etc. And I think it's extremely dangerous that we've seen through history, people like Hitler, that when they, when you signal to them weakness, that is extremely dangerous. The only thing they respect is strength, right? And you have to show that to them. And so by demonstrating the fact that we're drawing a red line with Ukraine or with Taiwan, which might very well be happening soon, because things I think are, are, are going to happen there at some point in the next five years or so. By drawing a red line, we have a deterrent capability and we can control it. But by signaling that we're turning inward, that it's only about Fortress America, I think is very, very dangerous. So on that side, I'm more of... I'm, I'm more on the real politic, more on the Kissinger side of, of having to look at the whole global picture. And so I think in general, we're living through a dangerous moment where there's not, there's not um, a kind of a real balance of power here where things can be, you know, things can spiral out of control. It's not necessarily what led up to World War I kind of thing, but it could, it could very easily that could very easily happen. So it's a worrisome moment. You know, um, I, I don't know if you had a chance to read Destined for War by Graham Allison. I don't know if you would recall that book. He was the dean of uh, the Kennedy School. Um, when I had the opportunity to uh, interact with uh, President Xi's team from China, this is going back to the transition, um, uh, President Xi brought that book with him to Mar-a-Lago in wow. April of 2017. Wow, yeah. That's fascinating. And so I had I had the opportunity to have read the book prior. So I was one of the people, at least in the administration, that was conversant in the book. What was the book about? Um, there were 16 episodes throughout modern history right. where a rising superpower was threatening the existing power structure. Of course, uh, in those 16 episodes, uh, 12 of them ended up in war. Uh, the ones that didn't, there was understandable reasons. You know, when Great Britain was in decline, but America was rising, there were enough of, in terms of kissing cousins, they had the same sort of uh, system, the same common law inheritance from Great Britain, sort of kissing cousins, if you will. So the British were more easily and readily acceptable of the American rise. Uh, but now you have a uh, uh, religious differences, you have economic differences, you have political differences in terms of an open system versus a closed system, and you have one power rising, threatening the existing power structure. Uh, some of the stuff that's going on in the Ukraine is a signal, frankly, to the Chinese uh, from the West. Uh, yeah, yeah, so we both realize that. And so, you know, my my position has always been that we need a transformative Western leader 
uh, that's able to distill these elements of what I'm discussing with you and then to help the West, to guide and lead the West as opposed to react to what's going on, to lead the West to better decision making and almost remake uh, and force a reordering of things. And again, not a new world order in the conspiracy sense of the nonsense on the web, but just to say, OK, what if we were coming out of war right now in 2022? How would we remake the world, OK, to forge a newer, fresher post-World War II order, if you will? Um, because unfortunately, the artifice of the post-World War II order, the acronyms of all these uh you know, the IMF, the UN, all the World Bank, all of these different things, they've had a good role, NATO, but we need a different rubric now. We need a different footprint. Yeah. It would require a Western leader um, to see that, to push that, and then to sell that not only to other Western leaders, but to the populations in the West to recognize, hey, we may have to give a little here to India or China. We may have to give a little on the fringes of what we're doing in order to make sure that we can guarantee another generation or three or four generations of peace. So you you get all of this. So this is why I was so fascinated and want to talk to you. Um, how do we get better leadership, sir? How do we get better leadership in the areas where we need it? Wow, um, these are big questions. Um, well, the, you know, there is a maxim that we often get the kind of leadership that we deserve, you know. So um, the problem that we face in America is that our thinking is so short term that people in politics that rise to positions of, of power and political power, they have to think in terms of one year or two year time frames, election, election cycles, et cetera, et cetera. So they don't have. They don't have the space to kind of create an overall vision of where this country should be headed. The kind of vision that, you know, that Kennedy might have had, had when he launched the New Frontier or Roosevelt with the New Deal. Where you're looking at something, you're looking at problems, and we believe me, we have plenty of problems here, and you're going, this is how we can solve them in a four-year or an eight-year time frame. We need to be patient. We need to do this, that, and the other. So a lot of the problems that we're facing in politics stem from the public, stem from our short-term attention spans, stem from social media that's kind of continually roiling us up, and we're locked in the moment. And it's hard to have leaders who can get step out of that and who can say, all right, where, where, you know, first of all, one thing that I always wish a politician would do today would be to say, what does it mean to be an American right now? What is our country? What, what, who are we at this point in our history? Maybe like you were saying, we need to reevaluate the world order like that happened after World War II and NATO. Well, maybe we need the same reassessment about our own country, et cetera. But to sort of articulate a vision of where we're going, of what you see this country should be in the next four or five years or so, is extremely difficult. We don't give any of these people the space to initiate that kind of longer term thinking. And it's not only in politics, it's in business. I served on the board of directors of a publicly traded company, um, American Apparel, and I saw firsthand how this operates in business, where your, your attention is continually focused on the quarterly report, on how Wall Street is viewing you, you know, on the optics of this and the other, of how much growth there is. And so to sort of step back and say, this is where the company should be in a couple of years. You know, these are times where things are changing so quickly that you need a leader who can say, this is where our business should be going to kind of navigate all these changes. It's absolutely impossible given the pressures that, that leaders now face in business, in politics, or even in sports or everywhere, shorter and shorter attention spans. So it's almost like we have to re-engineer human nature right now. We have to become more patient, more willing to have leaders who can say things that will displease us in the moment, who will say, yes, our country is going bankrupt in a few years, so we need maybe make some cuts here or there, to give us some pain, to deliver us some painful messages that we can accept. So it's, it's, it's a real problem. 
I think it's very well said. I want to I want to switch to in my remaining moments with you, with you, which are precious. Um, I want to switch to something a little fun. Oh, good. Um, okay, so we're going to go through again. These will be rapid fire. Okay, who's your favorite fictional character, Robert? My favorite fictional character. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm. Uh, th- there's a uh, a French writer who I like a lot, um, Stendhal. He wrote a book called a novel called The Red and the, the Red Black. and the, the Red and the Black. The yeah. Red and the Black. Yeah. And the main character, Julien, it's sort yep. of like he has to go through an educational process of learning what life is really about. Um, it's what they call in German a Bildungsroman. It's a, a novel of education or development. And he sort of learns the hard way. He gets rid of all of his naive romantic notions through all of these kind of tough experiences. I read that book in my early 20s, and I... I kind of really identified with the main character. So that would be one of my favorite fictional characters. There are many others, but that's who I choose first. Yeah, no, listen, I mean, that's a great one. You know, I, I, I'm probably a little more simplistic than you. My my favorite by far, and it's it's from the book, it's not from the movie, uh, it's uh, Don Vito Corleone because wow. of the, the understanding of his leadership role and the understanding, particularly when he talks to Santino in the book about the American presidency, and he looks at him and says, well, why are you so naive? Yes, I am killing people, but I'm killing made people. I'm not like the American president sending in, Ill, innocent civilians into war to uh, prosecute my political purposes. And the point being is that power is coming in many forms, many shapes and sizes, but it comes with these same sort of tenets of responsibility. So it's just a... It's a fascinating take on the system, if you will. That's a very good choice. Um, very interesting. But, but I like I like I like the red and the black. I remember Julian. That was something I read in my twenties as well. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna. These are three famous figures, and I want you to give me a one or two sentences on each. You started a little bit with Elon Musk and some of his insecurities. So let's let's skip him. And we'll go right to Alexander the Great. Your thoughts there? Um, he was um, he was a true visionary. Um, he was one of the first people to see that there could be some kind of way of creating a state or a nation that transcended uh, local ethnicities. He could create a larger kind of confederation of cultures, right? And um, he gets a bad rap because, he, you know, the bloodiness of, of some of his battles, etc. But he was absolutely brilliant. And um, he was a true philosopher king, schooled by Aristotle, etc., etc. Sure. So uh, he stands out in history as as a ruler who was actually also a philosopher who happened to die very well, young. I don't know if you had a chance to read Anthony Everett's uh, biography of Augustus, but there's a very That's famous a scene. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With the, I don't, do you remember the scene where Agrippa and uh, obviously his right hand person, General Agrippa, who was more of a militant, Augustus uh, himself was more of an organizer and uh, uh, a good, a good statesman, but didn't have the militancy of Agrippa. They go to visit the cadaver of uh Alexander, and of course, the myth is is that Augustus touched his face and broke the nose off the uh, cadaver, uh-huh. uh, which is which is uh, lore in Roman history. But it's also uh, it's 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 put into reverence by my fellow Italians about there is no immortality in the mortal world. So even the great Alexander, unfortunately, uh, he's faced with his own demise. Even though and, and even though he's revered by everybody, uh, he's faced with his own demise, or as our friend Marcus Aurelius would say, in momento more, yeah. you know, in this moment, this is could be our death. Um, one last person, and then I'm going to let you go, sir. You've been so generous with your time. I'm very grateful to you. Napoleon. Um, well, Napoleon is very dear to my heart. Um, 
You know, I wrote uh, 33 Strategies of War was in, largely based on, he was the main figure in that book. Um, and he, I call him the, the Mozart of warfare. He was incredibly creative and inventive. And I have a, a, a on my bookshelf here, I could pull it out for you, a 1,600-page volume called The Campaigns of Napoleon. Um, it's the most definitive book on it. And it details every single moment of every single campaign of his. And it makes you realize that he completely um, revolutionized the whole concept of warfare. It has never been the same since. And he was absolutely brilliant. And he has so many lessons in there about human nature. He had 10 years of absolute brilliance and then 10 years of total decline, right? So he runs the gamut of all these different things we can learn. We talk about ego, talk about insecurities, talk about power going to your head. It was extremely tragic what happened to him, but it was all of his own faults. And so that era is so full of drama and so full of incredible lessons and so many things we can learn from it that I'm just, I'm just obsessed with Napoleon. I just found him endlessly fascinating. And every, you know, I, I wanted to bring him up because obviously I knew that about you and, uh, um, your new book, of course, The Daily Laws, which I believe came out last year. I have it on my nightstand. I try to go through one of those a day. Uh, thank you for writing that. Are you able to tell us what you're writing about now? If not, that's fine. But um, it's it, This is a different book going in a slightly different direction. Um, I had a, a, a brush with death a few years ago. I, had, I suffered a stroke, came very close to dying. And so um, I obviously, in my books, have many chapters on confronting our mortality, which is a major theme in Marcus Aurelius and all of the Stoics. And so I, I have this point that I talk about in Human Nature and in the book with 50 Cent, that in confronting our mortality, it actually opens up this realm of what I call the sublime. It makes everything much more interesting, much more intense. It makes you appreciate life to a much fuller extent. So I'm writing a book that's kind of inspired that by that about how utterly sublime it is to actually be alive in the 21st century in the year 2022 or 2023 soon and how we don't we're, oh. we're not aware of that we walk around so immersed sure. in our banal daily lives that we're not aware of all the insane things that science is revealing to us about the world we live in etc cetera, etc cetera. and so it's a book to kind of open your mind up to the awesomeness of these few precious years that we have to be alive, because that is something that I had to personally confront four years ago. Well, listen, uh, I'm glad you're in good health now. Yeah. Uh, it's such a pleasure to meet you over this uh, podcast. Thank you for accepting my invitation. Oh, my pleasure. I look forward to, re I look forward to reading that book as well. Um, and, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, on Open Book, Robert Greene, legendary uh, author and uh, a wonderful student of history and human nature. Thank you so much for joining the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Anthony. I really enjoyed it.